first of all, I want to say welcome to everyone. Thank you for joining us today. I'm Sarah Mears. I'm Program Manager for Libraries Connected and delighted to be introducing the webinar this morning. Um, I think it's a really interesting time to be having a webinar on homelessness because I don't know if you've been catching up with the reports that um, I heard on the, particularly this morning on the radio that 26% more people are sleeping rough than in 2021. So after a, a bit of a dip in the pandemic, it's definitely on the rise and that does include hidden homelessness or those in temporary accommodation. And um, I think it's libraries are such empathic places and places where you know people are, are feel welcome. So it's really important that we are exploring this work and looking at how we can take local projects into a more national arena. So we've got four really amazing speakers for you this morning. And they're each going to speak for 10 minutes uh, about projects and programs that they've been working on. Uh, there will be time for you to ask questions at the end. So if you've got any questions, please do stick them in the chat. And if you can put a queue in front of them, that means we'll be able to pick them up more easily. And then we can either ask a question on your behalf, or if you prefer, you can unmute and ask your question. During the presentations, we'd just be really grateful if you wouldn't mind keeping your mics on mute so that there isn't any extraneous noise uh, making people sort of to hear. Um, and I think that's all I need to say in terms of housekeeping. So I want to make sure there's plenty of time for the speakers to give their presentations. So um, it's my delight really to um, hand you over to Debbie Hicks, Creative Director of the Reading Agency, to talk about uh, the Reading Agency's work on homelessness with the Universal Health Offer Group. So over to you, Debbie. Thanks very much, Sarah. I'll just load my PowerPoint. Can everybody see that? Brilliant. OK, well, hello, everyone. I'm really delighted to be here today to take part in this important discussion because, you know, as Sarah's just said, you know, we are we are facing a national crisis, which is seeing an increasing number of people experiencing or at risk of homelessness. Um, reading may not at first seem to be the most pressing need for this community, but it's about value and benefits have been a really important theme in the shaping of a library homelessness offer. And it was also the starting point for the reading agency's involvement in the discussion following an inquiry um, from the big issue actually about access to loans of reading well titles during the pandemic. So that inquiry really kick-started a much bigger conversation about what libraries were doing to support people experiencing homelessness, the partnerships in place um, and, and the challenges faced. And the question that rose was, you know, how best could the safe and warm space of the public library and its free services continue to serve the needs of this community? So supported by research and mapping and consultation, the Reading Agency, Libraries Connected and the Public Library Health Group have been working to put the building bl blocks of a library homelessness offer in place. And I'm really delighted to um, share the thinking so far with you today. But before I do, I thought it'd be useful to start with what we mean by homelessness. Uh, the accepted definition is that people who are uh, uh, who are experiencing or threatened by homelessness are people without accommodation, uh, living in temporary or crisis accommodation, or that which is severely inadequate or insecure. But as Sarah referenced um, earlier, it's important to remember that this definition also includes the hidden homeless, those who are staying with friends uh, and family who are sofa surfing or intermittently sleeping rough. And this group are statistically invisible, which makes it really difficult to estimate the real extent of the homelessness crisis. Bearing in mind that the stats are only the tip of the iceberg, the data tells us bleak story, which has been made worse by the pandemic and cost of living crisis. So more than 278,000 households were assessed as experiencing or at risk of homelessness in England in 2021-22, with the prediction that by 2024, core homelessness will rise to be one third higher than 2019 levels. And as Sarah has already mentioned, you know, the new stats that have just come out have shown that there's been already over the last year been a 26% increase in rough sleeping. The impact on those affected is severe, resulting in poor access to information and support services, challenges to providing for basic living needs and to those relating to emotional and social support, learning and skills development and health and well-being. 
The support needs of people experiencing homelessness are also often complex and more prevalent than in the general population. Nearly one in two people uh, experiencing homelessness have a mental health diagnosis, uh, rising to eight out of 10 of those sleeping rough. Between 2018 and 2021, over one third of people reported they were recovering from a drug problem and nearly one in two said they were using drugs or alcohol to help cope with their mental health. So public libraries are a really important lifeline for this community, providing safe, warm spaces and essential services. The prompt for thinking more about this offer came, as already mentioned, from a query about the big issue as to whether people experiencing homelessness were able to borrow books from the Reading Well Mental Health collections in public libraries as part of the DCMS supported Read Talk Share campaign. Working with Libraries Connected, we asked that question in a short survey around me library membership and support for this community. The result was evidence of lots of amazing good practice across the sector as part of CORD's delivery, alongside some really exciting examples of innovation and stretch. So the next step in the conversation was a webinar held in National Libraries Week 2021 to mark World Homelessness Day. The seminar was hosted by the Reading Agency and Libraries Connected, included as speakers the Big Issues uh, Lord Bird, who spoke passionately about public libraries, and the Big Issues uh, um, Chris Felchie Stead, who talked about the need for books and reading, which was highlighted by a vendor survey during the pandemic. Vendors highlighted books as the thing that they were most missing during that period. There was also some really moving stories from journalist Maeve McLennan, including that of a woman um, called Aisha, who was experiencing homelessness and found solace and escape on a daily basis by reading in the public library. We learnt about the community's pressing need for mental health support, learning and cultural enrichment, social engagement opportunities, as well as help with basic needs and signposting. And there were brilliant case studies of how libraries were already helping from Norfolk and the London Libraries Network, with other examples from across the sector covering accessible membership, staff training, events, and services providing sanitary products and warm, and warm clothing. So the session started to shape a really inspiring vision for the role public libraries play in supporting this vulnerable community. Key takeaways included the value of the warmth, security and non-transactional nature of physical library spaces that are free and open to all, of partnership working with relevant in-touch organisations to understand real need, support reach and effectively promote access to services, of specialist library signposting, referral and other relevant support, and of a clear offer marketing the library to this community. It also identified some challenges to address and these included the difficulties in communicating with a fast changing customer group who may not be aware of free services available in their local library, Access, issued, access issues linked to physical address requirements for membership in some authorities, as well as fines for overdue, damaged or lost materials, and the need for training to help library staff to build confidence in working with this customer group and the skills to provide appropriate help and signposting. But the building blocks of a universal library health offer, however, were very clearly already in place. With input from the Public Library Health Group, consultation with the library sector, this offer framework was further developed to recognise the value of those things that libraries already offer. The warm and safe community space, the digital access and training, the reading and learning opportunities that provide relaxation and escape and support literacy and access to information. A health and wellbeing support, opportunities for social and cultural engagement to combat loneliness and provide enrichment, signposting to referral and referral to specialist services and national and local partnership development. And it also identified those opportunities for extension and stretch, including membership, but uh, bypassing the need for, permanent, uh, for a permanent address, library workforce development to build skills and confidence, skills programmes for uh, skills development programmes for the homeless community, and support for basic needs such as food, warm clothing and hygiene products, as well as marketing, outreach and co-production of services. We've also worked with Libraries Connected to keep this work, to keep this thinking moving. And that's included a research review of the public library evidence base supporting, the, supporting this developing offer published early last year and available on our website. We've held a second workshop for the sector to test and approve the framework for 
um, and identify key priorities for development, um, including the need for a staff training and a library toolkit. We've invested in new work to take the vision forward, which has included the Reading Agency's Big Give campaign last Christmas, which raised over £22,000 to work with local library services and their partners to give 25,000 quick reads to homeless communities in Luton, Oldham, Cornwall, Birmingham and Newham. And these areas were all selected using Shelter's homelessness heat map and ACE priority places. And there's groundbreaking work get underway to shape a pan London offer and pilot and staff pilot training which I'm looking forward to hearing more about from um, Caroline and Anthony later in the session. We're also pleased to announce the launch of a new library toolkit supporting um, the, uh, supporting libraries to work with um, people experiencing or threatened by, uh, threatened by homelessness. This is now uh, launched today available from the Reading Well website and it provides context need and prevalence data the Libraries and Homelessness Offer Framework, which I've just referred to as part of the Universal Health Offer Strategy, information, case studies and useful tools, sources of local and national support, a template that libraries can adapt for crisis support and a call for good practice to add to the uh, growing evidence base around libraries work in this area. So, whilst libraries can't solve the homelessness crisis, they can definitely be part of the solution, providing signposting, support and a haven for one of our most vulnerable communities. As Tyler's campaigner Lord Bird states, I want to stress the fact that we're entering the biggest crisis I have ever known around homelessness. Libraries are an incredible place where homeless people can feel welcome. And the journalist Maeve McLennan added, libraries are a place of kindness and humanity. This is really important work and we at the Reading Agency are proud to be supporting libraries to, do, to be delivering it as part of the Universal Health Offer. Thank you very much. Mm, thanks for that Debbie. Uh, I'm looking forward to reading that, that new report because that looks fantastic and, and really inclusive of, of lots of things to, that we would need to have with us as, as part of our toolkit. So thank you for that um, and uh, thanks for that, those brilliant quotes as well. So I'm going to uh, just hand you over in a minute to Anthony Hopkins. Just before I do, just to say that we are recording this and a couple of people have asked about that uh, because they had to leave. We are recording it so we'll send you the link to the recording afterwards um, and that does mean if you don't want to be on the recording you can send the cameras off if you feel if you don't want to be on the on the recording um, but we will send you the link so you'll get all the slides and so on afterwards. But it's, it's now my pleasure to uh, hand over to Anthony Hopkins, Head of Library, Heritage and Adult Education Services for Merton Council who's going to talk a little about the London Library's Homelessness Training Project. Good morning, everybody, and, and, and welcome. And thanks, Debbie, for just setting the brilliant um, context for the session and obviously just demonstrating the work that's being done on a national level. And like Sarah, really looking forward to reading through the toolkit and, 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 and the resources. Um, what I've been asked to speak about this morning is about a project that we've undertaken through London Libraries and it was about enhancing our offer for, for, for our homeless communities um, through, through, through public libraries. Um, and you'll hear, be, be hearing from my colleague in, in Newham, Caroline, who will talk a bit more practically about the training and, and our key kind of delivery partner within the work, um, Homeless Link, um, and Laura Millwood later on about, about some of the approaches we took to the training and offer that we undertook. But just to take a step back in terms of what our, um, where we started on this, it was our long, long, long standing aspiration of London libraries to undertake a pan London wide project to address homelessness and provide residents with better support um, and information. And um, we, we've always wanted to take approach that was really collaborative and look to doing to streamlining services and delivering things in a way that, that, that works across all, all libraries in London. But also what I wanted to emphasise is the work that we've undertaken, we think is scalable um, and is very much shareable um, across across the country. We just took a, a, a London approach as through, through our heads of service network, it was really identified as a priority project and has really been ver further um exasperated through the pandemic and, and the ongoing cost of living crisis that we're under uh, undergoing um so the initial proposal in terms of when we started to develop the work and what we wanted to do was to de develop an offer for every library to sign up to to support homeless and vulnerably housed people with information advice signposting and support alongside facilitating this access to mainstream library usage 
we wanted to focus on staff development, um, providing training and ongoing go coaching to support library staff and volunteers um, to better manage relationships, both with um, the homelessness sector, but also with the customers that come in from, from, from a day-to-day -day basis. And we really reached out and wanted to work very much more closely with the homelessness sector to better understand the kind of provision that we should be providing and the kind of key things that we can channel um, to encourage greater usage and obviously to support residents to, to access better information. So we really focused on um, information advice, particularly around signposting, um, engaging communities, so our homelessness sector communities working with partners to understand the need as well and, 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 and perceptions of public libraries and also how to deal and just particularly around the staff training but particularly about how to deal with difficult and challenging behaviours so particularly around um, some of our customers may present with drug and alcohol usage dependencies and, and, and some of the, the issues around managing that um, and that very much fed into the trauma reformed approach which you'll hear a little bit more about later on um, from other colleagues. So in order to kickstart the program, we utilised the regional support funds, which were administered by Libraries Connected via Arts Council to commission activist group to work with us to develop a comprehensive repeat feasibility report and plan in order to um, start the works to start the works. Um, we established a governance board, which consisted of London Libraries representatives plus Libraries Connected, the Reading Agency, Homeless Link, who are our main training delivery partner, Big Issue, um, a housing lead from our, one of our local authorities, so a head of head of housing, Arts Council, and two homeless charities as well, so Spot and Mungos, and that formed the governance board that that helped to develop the program. And so through the work that we did, we um, developed a pilot project where five par five boroughs, five London boroughs participated in the design and the implementation of the approach. And those pilot boroughs were Barnet, Newham, Islington, Brent and Hillingdon. And prior to the rollout, we undertook quite a lot of consultation and engagement around what to design within the training and what kind of standards of service and information we should be designing. So we undertook um, user surveys both with head, heads of services across London, library staff, customers, and most importantly, the homeless sector, um, and particularly with feedback from clients. So um, Homeless Link actually undertook sessions in our libraries to obviously really um, Give, give some some feedback around around the perceptions and particularly from their clients perceptions of public libraries and I think it'd be fair to say that actually the perception from from the majority of our of, of, of our homeless communities was really positive about libraries I think they they really felt that they were really important to them um, many were accessing already but some of the things that were barriers were particularly around terms and condi conditions and practices of and um, and maybe conflicting practices across different authorities and that perception of how, how welcome they would feel, particularly if they have no fixed address. So some of those were key things we wanted to factor into the programme. So from this training, a, a programme was established and delivered by Homeless Link. And as I said, Caroline Ray, my colleague from Newham, will talk more about the training as a participant. And Laura Millwood from Homeless Link will talk more about the trauma-informed approach and the training. But where we are now is that we've um, delivered the pilot across the five local authorities. Um, all have reported very positive feedback from what's been undertaken um, and are now deploying the learning and resources that were developed for, in their authorities. So a training package has been designed to train all authorities and we've built that into inductions and appraisal processes in those authorities to ensure that the staff continue to be trained and that we have a plan for continuing to develop and our, our own development through libraries and working with the homelessness sector. As part of the programme, we reviewed our policies and procedures, um, and we'll look and we're looking at the proposal is that we streamline those across all the 33 London boroughs um, to ensure that the support that users experience is, is, is standardised. And particular things that we focused on is membership without fixed address accepting users from our, outside of or from other boroughs and discretion discretion in charging fines and provision around um, 
personal belongings and storage of items, which is also quite, 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 quite an issue. Um, so we've agreed some standards across the sector around that. In terms of information and signposting of local services, we really wanted to ensure that, 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 that this works at a local level. So beyond establishing the pan London approach, um, what you will find in a lot of your own lo local authorities is that the provision and the way that provision to support homeless communities is delivered through different partners and different charities at a local level. So we were ensured that all of the pilot services had, had local contacts um, and could signpost through to local services for accommodation, food, community and street outreach, day centres, um, and secure weather emergency provision as well, so that we can ensure that staff are very confident in navigating and, 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 and signposting people and liaising with our, our homeless um, organisations. So the partnerships, um, and, and obviously the other thing was, as part of that, was establishing partnerships with name local organisations, so that's all accessible and known and understood by staff, because one of the issues we found, particularly in the pilot, was that um, some staff were maybe being a little bit too over helpful, um, you know, and trying to help 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 where they would be better signposting through to um, the various homeless organisations that support our, our residents. And it's kind of part of the, the training was actually about knowing when to when when you've done enough and when you can pass that over and obviously making sure that you know the, the resident or the, the individual is really put at the heart of what we're doing and really making sure that they get the you know the professional support and resources that they really need and I think that was a big part of what we did within the training. So now we've been through the pilot as I said we've got the program embedded in the five boroughs the next step is to um, bid for further funding um, to uh, roll out the program across the 33 London authorities so really pleased that through the pilot we've got those standardized practices and approaches um, and a comprehensive training package which is really ready to go so we're now just developing bids now to 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 um, deploy the work across across the whole of London um, as I said at the beginning as well all the work that we do we feel is is scalable um, and relatable to the rest of the rest of England um, and, and 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 the rest of our libraries connections membership we just took a London libraries approach because it really has been a key thing for us within within London and help has helped us in terms of scaling it up to really do it in this way so um so we, we're really pleased that we are where we are now and obviously now working to um to, to bid for this work um on a london level um so i'm going to pause there um and hand back to sarah but thank you very much for listening to me thank you and i think you're on mute sarah Still not coming through, or is it just me? It's starting to come through. Try again. <laughs> if not, shall I hand on to the next speaker, Sarah? Yeah. yeah. So, okay, that's absolutely no problem at all. So, it's always technology problems in these in these kind of things. Um, I've got a bit of a camera problem myself at the moment, so I was expecting my camera to freeze at any moment. It hasn't done it yet, but I'm sure it will do in a, in a little bit. But um, just obviously we set some context around the London Libraries project um, and, and obviously how it relates into the bigger picture of what, what Debbie described before for the reading agency. Um, next, wanted to introduce um, Caroline Ray, who's the strategic lead for libraries in the London Borough of Newham. And Caroline and her service were one of the pilot boroughs um, in the London Libraries project and actually undertook the training herself along with her staff. So just wanted to hand over to her now to give some personal reflections on completing the training through the London Libraries Homelessness Project. Caroline. Okay, thanks Anthony. Okay, I'm just going to share my screen and hopefully... Okay, it says only hosts can share Robert, can I oh, share my I'll, screen, I'll make you a co-host, Caroline. Thank Sorry. You. 
Sorry, bear with me a second, Caroline. No, no problems. You should be a co-host now, Caroline. Sorry, now I'm just being used to this here. Right, can you see my screen? Yes. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> okay, um, so I'm just gonna give a, a little bit of an overview about why Newham took part in the in the London Library's pilot and why we were so keen to do so, um, and then some of our experiences of, sort of what the training was like and, and then some thoughts about that. Um, so on your map you can see uh, a very very dark borough um, and that's Newham. Um, so within Newham one in 21 people um, are homeless um, which compares against an average in London of one in 58. Um, we have 48.3 in a thousand households and temporary accommodation against the London average of steam with 7,895 children in temporary accommodation. So we've got 28,000 on our housing register with approximately 600 homes available every year. So the the level of homelessness in, in Newham is, is um, quite significant. Added to that is that at one of our libraries, in particular in East Ham Library, the council's homelessness team at one point were based on the first floor alongside our council contact centre. And this has meant that we have a range of agencies, including the police at points, who either bring or refer people experiencing homelessness or have just become homeless to the library and say, go to East Ham Library, they'll be able to help. And that's caused us an enormous amount of difficulties um, and some really challenging situations for frontline staff. Um, straightforward things like people refusing to leave at the end of the day until they're, until they're, they're given accommodation overnight um, or as Anthony alluded to, staff getting really involved in trying to help people way beyond their expertise and what and what they're able to do. So, so for us, taking part in this training was really important. Um, so, in terms of the actual training itself, um, it was one day. It was a one day course that was then followed up by um, a, a shorter online session um, about six weeks later. In terms of what that training covered, we started off by looking at um, homelessness law. So we looked at statutory and non-statutory homelessness, what this meant in practice, what it meant to be legally homeless, and what a local authority's duty was in relation to those different classifications. And that really helped to contextualise the enormous complexity of supporting people who were experiencing homelessness, um, which I felt helped helped frontline staff to understand actually they could be making the situation a lot worse if they got too involved and actually that our role is more about that signpost and that we are not caseworkers. Um, the next part of the train and then looked more closely at homelessness in London. Um, we looked at the causes of homelessness. We looked around challenging stereotypes and misconceptions. We looked at numbers. We looked at the views, as Anthony said, we looked at the views of people with lived experience in using library services. And yeah, there were definitely positives, but there were also barriers. Um, and I think that was really important and enabled group discussions about what it might be like for people experiencing homelessness to use our libraries. Um, some of those concerns about, you know, that a member of staff's attitude might change once they they realise that the resident, the person's homeless. That, um, you know, once it gets difficult to prove where you live, then people's attitudes change around number of bags, um, about being worried about borrowing 
books because that book might get lost or that book might be damaged. So how do you borrow a book but keep it in the library so that no one else can borrow it, but actually it stays safe and you can look. So it's, it's, it's some really interesting conversations among staff when, with that feedback. Um, the third section of the training went on to look at trauma informed practice, and I'm not going to go into that too much because I know Laura's going to talk about it in a moment. Um, but I think there was an absolute light bulb moment around the room um, when you started to think about how pertinent this was to libraries, um, not just with people experiencing homelessness, but so many of our customers um, and how we how we really need to build trauma informed practice into the way that we work. Um, so then this, this section, we also looked at um, some good practice around trauma informed communication, about strength based approach, separating people from the behaviour, thinking about our own behaviours, our own triggers um, and being able to assess risk. Um, and, it, and it provided some really valuable and practical tips to support frontline colleagues in their work with people who have experienced trauma. And then on the final part of the day, we moved on to looking at that local level that Anthony was talking about. So looking, so one, um, looking at some resources that would help us to understand what was available in the local offer. Um, and also those services that might require referrals um, as opposed to ones that we can, that we can just signpost to. Um, and then we we did a very practical part after that, which was then actually sitting and we went into little groups of our boroughs and we actually sat and we went online and we and we started trying to look at who the different agencies were were within our our borough that could that could help us and then think about what are the actual steps that we're going to take next to be Hi, able to, to implement some of this learning. Yeah, Caroline, uh, the slides don't seem to be moving on, so. Do you just be able to move the slides? Sorry to interrupt. Okay, sorry. I only had a couple of slides, so it should be on the third slide now. Is it not moved on? No, we're still on the first slide. <laughs> I think you need to go okay. into slideshow on the screen. Right, okay. Let me stop sharing. See, we've all got used to Teams now. It just makes it easier. <laughs> You're yeah. like, oh, I'm, back on, I'm back on Zoom. How do I do it? Um, if, it, if, it's, if, it if it's, I can share share the slides afterwards to everyone yeah, who's joined. Yeah, if that I helps, mean, Caroline. Yeah. I think so. There were there were only a couple, so um, so I'll just move on. So the 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 kind of our key takeaways really were um, that important fact that library. Frontline library team members aren't caseworkers. Um, most of us, we, we kind of, it's the people who are drawn to the profession have that innate desire to help, but we simply aren't qualified when it comes to being able to help people with really complex housing needs. Um, so our role is to signpost. And therefore it's really important that we understand the local agencies and support services that we can support, we can signpost to. Um, so it's about us needing to have much better relationships, not only with the council's homelessness prevention team, but also building meaningful strategic relationships with other organizations in our local areas who support people experiencing homelessness. Um, I think it's it's fair to recognise that we don't always do a good job at making people experiencing homelessness feel welcome in our buildings. Yeah, there's lots that we do that's great and, and we know that lots of people do value that the libraries are there, but we don't always do it just as good as we could do. Um, so I, some of that feedback that we got from the focus groups really resonated with me and I think it kind of confirmed many suspicions that I had about what it might be like with certain frontline members of staff. Um, so I think, you know, looking at the, with London Libraries, we're looking at the charter and I think the charter is going to go a long way to setting an expectation of, of, of how we would want our libraries to be welcoming. Um, and then really, again, another takeaway, as we said before, about that trauma-informed approach being central to our work. In terms of Newham, 
are kind of our next steps that have come on since the training. So like many libraries um, across the country, we've become warm havens over the winter. Um, we are open another, an additional 92 hours um, over the winter. So all libraries are open until 8 p.m. Monday to Saturday, and they're all open on a Sunday, providing hot drinks and a range of activities for people who need to come in and be warm. Um, I'm now part of a council-wide working group on trauma-informed practice. Um, so it was really good when people in the boroughs within the council started talking about it to be able to say, oh, hang on a minute, this is something that libraries are starting to look at. Um, and we've, you know, some of us have done this training um, with Homeless Link and we and we think it's going to be really valuable. So that's given us, you know, I'm able to take part in that working group. Um, We've also got an agreement and budget given for all frontline library team members to attend this training. Um, so although London Libraries is looking for external funding for all of London to be trained, um, Newham, we've managed to secure the money for, for all library staff in Newham to take it anyway. Um, and we're starting to look on an action plan specifically around East Ham Library because we've got some really significant issues there, but that intention is then to roll that out across other libraries um, and then as Anthony said we will be reviewing our policies and procedures um, which is also going to be informed by the London Library Standard and Charter being developed and that's kind of where we we are now so if I can oh. hand back to Sarah. Yeah. Thanks, Caroline. I hope I, can, I hope you can hear me now. I've put my headphones on, so I hope they're okay. Um, great, so that's good to know. Um, so thanks, Caroline. And you're, what you're doing in Newham and what you've managed to achieve is just amazing, really. So, um, yeah, it's, it's really great. And it's really great how that project has generated all of that. And when we've been talking about this project, the trauma-informed approach is just something that every member of library staff I've heard talking about it has just been absolutely bowled over by and it's made such a difference to them. So I'm really delighted that we have Laura with us today. Laura Millwood, Senior Learning and Development Manager from Homeless Link, who's going to talk a little bit about that trauma-informed approach. So over to you, Laura. Thanks, Sarah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. This is so exciting and great, and I, I really appreciate being invited to speak. Um, so Caroline just gave a really great overview of the, the training as a whole, um, and I'm just going to touch on the trauma-informed element of the training. Um, a lot of people, um, we deliver this training to the homelessness sector, frontline staff working in homelessness services, um, and a lot of people come out of these sessions just saying, this was a complete game changer for me. Not only has it it sort of made me look at how I support people um, at work, but also how I deal with things at home. It can be a, a real sort of, as um, someone uh, alluded to earlier, a light bulb moment. Um, so it's quite exciting to talk about trauma from care. So I'm just going to break the system and try and share my screen. Bear with me one second. Okay, definitely. Um, you can all see being trauma informed an introduction. Fab. So just to let you know, there will be a, I will be talking about trauma. It will be very light touch, but just a bit of a sort of trigger warning just to make sure that everyone's aware. Um, so we're just going to look at what is being trauma informed, what is trauma, and then sort of the benefits of having that training um, for library staff. Um, so it's going to be a very sort of whistle stop tour today. Um, so what is being trauma informed? Well, it's about understanding how someone's past experiences might have affect their current responses. So their thoughts, their feelings and their behaviours. Um, this understanding gives us greater confidence and patience to work with people whose behaviour seems challenging or complex. Um, research shows that it's common for people who who are homeless or who have experienced homelessness have been through a past trauma and I'm sure you also agree that becoming homeless it's set in, an, in itself is also a traumatic um, event. So what is trauma? Um, many things that can be experienced um, are considered to be traumatic and it can go from anything from having a parent with mental health problems, um, surviving a natural disaster, being detained under the Mental Health Act, being neglected as a child. So there are new an, an unlimited a number of different ways that someone can feel that they've been through a traumatic experience. Um, but we sort of look at it as um, three, oh, sorry, apologies. Um, 
So SAMHSA, the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, say that trauma results from an event, a series of events or set of circumstances that is experienced by an individual as physically or emotionally harmful or threatening and that has lasting adverse effects on the individual's functioning and physical, social, emotional or spiritual well-being. So I think that's a really good way of summarising what trauma is. So we can look at trauma um, from three different sort of angles. You've got acute trauma, and this is the result from a single stressful or dangerous event. There's chronic trauma. This results from repeated and prolonged exposed, um, prolonged trauma that's exposed to highly stressful events. And then you've got complex trauma. This results from exposure to multiple traumatic events of an interpersonal nature, so with a group of people. Good news is, though, um, is that recovery is possible. So the person who has experienced trauma um, is in a constant state of anxiety and fear. So I think if you if you bear that in mind, you know, when people are accessing services, the way they behave, it's not surprising that they can be potentially challenging, upset, um, because, you know, they, they're literally living in a sort of fight or flight moment a lot of the time. So um, their brain is hardwired to respond quickly to triggers, usually to keep themselves safe. Um, so that's something to bear in mind when people are accessing services. But um, it is possible for the brain to sort of create new pathways um, to be able to, to um, create safe relationships in the future. So it is possible to move on from experience, having experienced trauma. And that's potentially where library staff can come in. So there are five key principles to um, being trauma informed. There's inclusion transparency, trust, collaboration, being strengths-based, so looking at people's strengths rather than then. It's about sort of when someone comes into us into normally a, a homelessness service, it's about asking what's happened to you rather than what's wrong with you. You wouldn't do that in a library service, but that's how we sort of view it in homelessness. And then safety. So, being trauma informed, trauma is the impact on the individual, not the event itself. And each person's response to a traumatic event will be different. Being trauma informed is recognize, recognizing how the impact of the trauma might be affecting someone in the present day and helping people to recover, to regain safety and control. So, being trauma informed um, will help people recover from, survive, from survival mode by building trusting relationships. And also being trauma-informed will ensure that people avoid re-traumatisation. Sort of say within homelessness services, as an example, someone can go in with a domestic, um, a, an experience of domestic abuse and they'll go into a, a day centre, for example, they'll give that story over and then they'll be sent to the council. They'll have to give that story over again and then they'll go somewhere to support accommodation and give the story again. And it's about not asking people to repeat their stories um, so that they don't get uh, re-traumatised. So just, I thought it'd be useful to go over some triggers. Um, th and this was fully covered in the training. Sort of understand what you can expect when people access your service. So these are all potential triggers. So being asked questions could be a, a trigger to somebody. Being in a building that feels institutional and has CCTV cameras, for example. Being in a shared space of trainer, tr strangers might be difficult for some people. Seeing security staff, people in uniforms and feeling like you're being watched, being judged on your appearance, which I'm sure you all completely understand. And um, having rules and being told what to do can be quite triggering um, potentially for people. Then there's also someone touching your bag or your belongings without asking or really just generally just touching them. Um, feeling exposed within the, the room that you're in not knowing how to use a service or where to go in the building, um, potentially loud noises um, and being hungry, tired or in pain. They're all triggers to bringing up the trauma that someone's experienced. And then what we did after that was we looked at um, sort of what staff can do to alleviate these triggers. So, I mean, yeah, I'll just go through them all. So we've got friendly, having eye contact and greeting people when they enter a service, 
um, having key information uh, in plain English and shared verbally where possible, having clear signage, um, explaining what's on offer um, and how the service works. You know, one thing about being trauma informed is treating everyone as they're human and sort of treating people how you would like to be treated. So when you enter a service, if you're not sure what to do, what would you expect? You'd expect to, um, to be supported by somebody within the service. Um, having giving polite reminders and not telling off. So that might be around someone might have a couple of too many bags and you're just politely asking them to move them out of the way or finding a safer place for them to put them as like a group of school children enter the library just so that there's enough space, for example. And then being as flexible as possible. So um, if someone doesn't have any ID, allowing them to get books out still um, and yeah, having space for things like bags. Um, doing things like this is likely to reduce incidents. Um, and it's also just a, sort of about you know, everyone being treated equally where possible. Um, yeah, that's pretty much it for me. Oh, thank you, Laura. That's that's really, really powerful. It's it's so it's actually so simple, isn't it? But it's actually so, so important. And um, I was just thinking we recently did a, a session on autism friendly libraries and, and so many of the same things apply in that situation as well. So it's 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 core to what we do, really, I think it's really, really important. So thank you. And, and thanks to all the speakers this morning. It's been a really interesting session and really really powerful as well. Um, we have quite a few questions. So if it's okay with the questions, I was just going to ask people to unmute and ask their questions. And we'll try and ask as many as we can. And uh, we've got just, uh, just over 45 minutes, 15 minutes rather, which is great. So um, Hannah, you were the first person to ask a question and I think it was quite an important one. Would you mind unmuting and asking your question? Yeah, so I, I really just raised, I thought what, what many people might be thinking, and, and we were one of the pilot authorities in the London Libraries training, so um, probably some of my colleagues have, have kind of covered the answer in part, but I think the trauma-informed stuff did really help with that. But my question was essentially about, um, you know, the the you can often get a, a quite a difficult dynamic of people um, in the library with showing quite challenging behaviours and, it, and it's quite difficult and quite stressful for library staff to manage and I think um, we had that in a number of our libraries and, and we're finding that the, the responses we're getting from local services are not necessarily um, uh, what they might have once been as people you know as everybody's under much more pressure um so it's really what was in the toolkit about about you know how to handle difficult situations and i think you know um i would just kind of endorse the my staff also felt they got a lot from the from the trauma informed training on the on the on the program thanks hannah um Debbie, do you want to just just come in and just? I know you yeah. answered in the chat, but yes, yes. I mean, you know, it's just a, it was really interesting to hear Laura and to um, to see her PowerPoint actually, and you know, I think. Um, written support can never replace face-to-face sort of -face training so I think training is uh, you know uh, really key in all of this but um, the toolkit is an evolving model there are there there is signposting in it and there's um, there are case studies but we can add sections so I you know I think for, if Laura was happy it would be great to add her powerpoint into that toolkit um, as a support resource um, and you know uh, so so I think it's something we can take away and uh, and develop um, but I, but I, you know, I, I, having listened to Anthony and to Caroline, it, you know, that face to face training is 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 the is the number one option, really. But there are, you know, as Laura says, there are useful tools and techniques that simple ones that that can be put in place. Thank you. Um, and there's a there's a couple of people who've asked about. Um, other other we have other library users trigger rather than staff. I wonder what experience oh I see what you mean. I wonder what experience Laura has from working in homeless situations as they often escalate quickly. Is that um is that something Laura you could respond to? Sorry, I'm not sure I understand the question. I think I think I think do, do, sorry, I can the, I can say yeah, sorry. I just realised yeah. my name hasn't come up. Mm. Um, so we have situations where there will be um, perhaps a number of people who've come in who are trauma affected, and um, they'll like kick off against each other, and the situation will escalate very quickly 
and end up being quite physical or aggressive um, and we have to call the police and I just wondered in terms of your experience um, that's not to do with the way that staff are dealing with it although they might have to be able to be aware of it but it might happen out of um, sight of them but then it impacts on all other users um, and also means that we then have to perhaps put in an exclusion which we don't want to do so I just wondered if you have any experience in terms of how you can manage any of those situations um mm, I'd have to get back to you on that um because yeah can I if I give you my email address can I get yeah. that no, I'm just thinking in terms of where you have a, um, a homeless project and you would have lots of people who've got lots of different yeah. triggers going on. Well, that's often the situation that we have in our public um, library, uh, our public computer area. Mm -hmm. And it would just something will kick off and it would just escalate and it would be like call 999. So and it would be really yeah. good because I mean, then we have to exclude people and what we don't want to do is to yeah. exclude people who are the most fun where we know they're going and then they've just got the street. What I would just add on that, just to come in on that one as well, as obviously with, with, with the homeless project, this was particularly about working with working with individuals, so mm. individual cases or, or, or small mm. groups. With, with what you've just described, I would say that would be more around managing conflict. And, yeah. and there's actually a, a very good trainer um, I don't want to name the person, maybe we can put it in the chat afterwards, but there's someone who's done um, conflict management training across quite a lot of authorities, I know, um, and it's particularly for those kind of situations mm. in terms of where, sadly, if it's escalated to that point, it's it really is what the staff can try and do to, to defuse the situation. And yeah. maybe we ha All the staff them. have had training here, yeah. but I just wondered if there was anything else, because it is that trauma response, which is out of somebody's yeah. control and i think the trauma the trauma based um training i think really helps understand mm. starting mm. points i think i think the feedback we've got from staff is that that it, it gives a better understanding around what's happening in that person's life which then can relate into how you potentially match manage that conflict yeah. and i think you know what what laura just very shortly you know succinctly mm. summarized there it's just sometimes just understanding where those starting points are and maybe detecting things before it even escalates yeah. to that, that point. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and somebody's just asked about whether the training is available outside of London. I guess, I mean, that, that that's going to be dependent on your, your authority and what's available, but we are looking at, you know, whether there, there are the potential for sort of, you know, doing, providing some sort of national support because I think that the training has been so powerful that we really want to look at how we can scale this project and roll out some of those training resources and training uh, uh, courses as well. Um, somebody has asked a question in the chat and it's there are a couple of people talking about it about the kind of practicalities the the practicalities of, of waiving needs for id and all of those things i don't know if those of you from uh, anthony and caroline particularly could talk a little bit about how that was managed um and and, and what you've done about that and how other other services in london deal with that yeah sure so i think from our perspective you know having that having that agreement across the authorities was really crucial and doing the engagement with the heads of service and staff throughout just meant that we managed to come up with a set of standards that could be agreed and adopted across the 33 authorities so having in place those procedures about no fixed address and other things were things that set were, were built into our standards mm. um so it was all part of the negotiation and discussion around how we did that but you know particularly for our homeless communities as well for any resident really they don't see borough boundaries and, and that was part of the challenge we had was that people were seeing you know they were going from from one authority to the other different practices different ways in which they were treated which obviously gives quite a negative impact so we really wanted to try and eradicate that through what we're doing so um you know all of the things that we've put in around 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 addresses um obviously we couldn't put something in to say that we were all going to um you know remove fines because obviously that's still for the local authority decision but we did put something in particularly around better um uh well but just um using a bit of um oh what's the word discretion within 
within how that's applied and taking into consideration personal circumstances. I don't know if you wanted to come in, Caroline. Um, yeah, I mean, I think on the, the no ID, um, that's something that some library authorities in the UK have been doing for 10, 15 years. So I know I th in some ways, London's always been a little bit behind the curve and not having um, and still requiring ID. So I think we're just following in the footsteps of what other people have done. I think another thing that was really important to us when we were thinking about this standard is that we don't want people who are experiencing homelessness to feel that somehow they've got a lesser type of library membership or somehow they're, they're, they're not entitled to the full offer. That all just felt really wrong to us and therefore whatever we had to do had to be applied across everybody who is a library member um, and just making it as inclusive as possible. Yeah, it's really powerful. And I, Liz, Liz Gardner, you, I think you, you put an interesting point in the chat. Do you want to, if you're on, on the call, so could you just unmute and just, just exam, expand on that a little more? Yeah, I can. Oh, video's gone off and off and off. Yeah, um, I was just, I think one of the things that uh, the other lady mentioned about, you know, how you deal with um, homeless people who who might cause issues within the the library space and how that's dealt with. One thing we've I've experienced quite a lot is where um, generally where I've been, um, the homeless community, long term homeless community, they're very aware of each other, and there's a lot of external rivalries and 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 problems that go on beyond the library space and they will often bring that into the library space so they're kind of triggering each other just by being in the library space together at the same time so what we've tended to do is we tend to kind of make sure we're aware of those people and those kind of trigger situations and where when you have both those people in together that's likely to cause something to kick off and then we kind of manage that within the space so it might just be that we kind of say oh you know there isn't a computer free for you at the moment can you come back in an hour just so that they're not in the same building at the same time mm -hmm. it's just just little things like that you know um or we might say oh come and have a coffee and a chat for a bit you know we've got a place as a welcome going on or something um just to keep them away from the other person who might be on the computer for example um and that that usually kind of works um so i just i was just mentioning that really yeah thanks liz yeah yeah it's a sort of practical and it's it's about knowing your community isn't it as well so it is because it's, it's yeah. better to manage it than it is to obviously you don't want to go down the route of excluding people or making no. anybody feel unwelcome so it's just it's just really knowing your customers and and knowing who's who's likely to potentially cause a problem if they're in together mm. yeah yeah Thank you. Um, we, we've got so many questions coming into the into the chat. I think what we'll have to do is we will um, just 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 share the questions and then try and get some responses to those that we haven't been able to raise today. So if you have got any, um, there's somebody who's, who said they wanted to raise something. Is it someone virtual? I'm sorry. Do you want to yeah, just that, raise that your? Was, um, yeah. That that was me. Oh. Um, so yeah, I mean, I'd like to sort of try and sort move back to the bigger picture in the library staff by the very nature of the term provide library services should they be expected to replace because that's what's happening in my borough the staff that provided one-to-one -one, face to face assistance with vulnerable individuals and everybody else who required other specialist council services because that's not what they signed up for mm. I mean, when they became library staff yeah anthony caroline or actually debbie if any of you want to respond to and that i know anthony and caroline both touched mm -hmm. on this before mm. so i would i would actually say it's really important that the that that's recognised and actually part of what we were doing is actually strengthening the relationships between other council services and, and homeless organisations within well, the borough. With, with, res with respect, Anthony, it's not a yeah. case of strengthening them, it's a case of re replacing them because they've well, been removed. We, we, I mean, obviously, I can't 
comment on on each individual borough but but obviously from from the boroughs that have participated i think obviously our role as library um, professionals is around information and signposting and what we were really trying to do within the project was strengthen that and actually the cases that we saw more of was where staff were going above and beyond what they mm. should really be doing and actually there are professionals within the network that should be doing as, that as they always have anthony as they always mm. have mm. As they always yeah. have. I mean, I worked in reference for seven years in, in the borough that I work for. And I'm now a professionally qualified librarian and, and manage other staff. And I've got to say, I really do feel for them because what's expected of them now, because all the, all the support mechanisms, all the, all the, the previously available support staff have gone in in things like one-stop shops that provided that kind of one-to-one -one contact mm. and advice yeah. and now libraries are replacing that and i just i don't agree with it mm. I think that we need to take into consideration that that is at different different boroughs and different approaches. Mm -hmm. You know, if I if I just spoke for my own borough, I would say that actually we've got a much more joined up approach around that, and actually that the support we get from other sections is better than what I saw five to ten years ago. Yeah, so I, I realise it's yeah. not just the same expecting, there, but... but accepting that there are differences, and I do do take on your point. I think Debbie wanted to come in. Apologies. Mm -hmm. No, no, I, 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 I was just going to reiterate really that, you know, the, the theme that's come through today around, you know, that being clear that library staff are not case support workers and, you know, we're not there to really do that in depth, have that in depth involvement. But what they are there to do and what they've always done is that signposting and referral. And it's about having really effective systems in place to do that and knowing where to send people on, I think. Um, I mean, you know, it doesn't overcome some of the issues that have already been discussed today, but I, I, I mean, being, you know, having a really clear signposting and referral network and those mm -hmm. partnerships at a local level, which aren't just, you know, aren't just the local authority partnerships, but are the, you know, the community partnerships with organisations working on the ground to support homeless people, yeah. uh, I think is the, is the way yeah, forward. Uh, yeah, and, well, and I, I mean, I, part, of the, part of the problem there is having a yeah. receptive person or organization to signpost them to yeah that's true uh, so i'm really sorry i'm gonna have to sort of stop you there because I'm, I'm conscious we're running over time and i know people are, are diving off so but i just wanted to say thank you to, to you and everyone else actually for your for your comments and, and having a quite a discussion it sounds like it's something that we may need to return to because there's lots to discuss um across the across the the, the service especially as there is a rollout um but i just wanted to quickly just thank the speaker so thanks very much to Debbie Hicks, Anthony Hopkins, Caroline Ray and Laura and all of you for your comments, the questions that you've asked and the comments in the chat as well.